Hello students, I am Dr. Utsab Bansal, Ophthalmology Faculty Marrow and this is a video on NEET Postgraduate 2022 Questions of Ophthalmology, The Recall. As is the trend guys, NEET PG usually does not ask you any difficult questions or out of the world questions. The questions were fairly simple and as is the trend, since 200 questions have started coming, 6 questions came from Ophthalmology. The questions were fairly equitably distributed, one from glaucoma, one from retina, one from uvia slash trauma, one from sclera, one from cornea, as you can hear all are ones everybody, yes. So let us begin our discussion of NEET PG 2022. Question number one, probably one of the easy identifiable questions if you had seen the image, image based direct question, what is the diagnosis? No history, nothing was given straight away, it was an image spotter. So now let us spot the image. What do we see in the image everybody? We see that this is the iris. The pupil has been fairly well dilated and we can see the lens. Now on the lens, what can we see? What abnormality? That is basically the identifier here. Yes. So on the lens, we can see a central disc. If I can draw a central disc of whitish deposit. Can I say so? Then a clear area. And then peripherally a band of deposit. So a disc of deposition, a clear area and a band. It looks like a dart game. Can I say a ring, then another ring? Yes. So this is called famously as which sign guys? Target sign. Now if you had ever seen this photograph, this is a direct spotter from our videos on glaucoma everybody. You would have known this is target sign and the question becomes very easy to solve. It becomes a case of pseudo exfoliation syndrome or pseudo exfoliation glaucoma let us discuss pseudo exfoliation syndrome quickly everybody pseudo exfoliation syndrome or pseudo exfoliation glaucoma what is this guys this is a chronic disease which is age related and it is a disorder of extracellular matrix which leads to Deposition of, what did we see? Deposition of whitish material. What was it? Deposition of fibrillary material. Yes. And wherever this fibrillary material gets deposited, it leads to the clinical features. So what are the clinical features? The most characteristic clinical feature, if I can say so, is this. What we can see in the other image. Another image which can come out of pseudo exfoliation syndrome everybody. In this we don't see anything deposited on the lens. Rather we see at the pupillary margin the fibrillary material has been deposited. What is this known as? This is known as snox or nox everybody. Yes. So deposit at pupillary margin. Apart from this everybody what other clinical features we know? We have read it under glaucoma. Why have we read it under glaucoma? Because we know that the fibrillary material gets deposited on trabecular meshwork. When it gets deposited on trabecular meshwork, it will obstruct the outflow. Trabecular meshwork glaucoma, this much we know, it leads to secondary open angle glaucoma. Please remember this secondary open angle glaucoma that we are saying. Pseudo exfoliation syndrome is the most common identifiable cause of secondary open angle glaucoma okay it's a direct question in itself everybody which of the following diseases is the most common cause of secondary open angle glaucoma that is pseudo exfoliation syndrome moving forward guys what are the other clinical features see on lens it is deposited known as target sign, the photograph that has been asked to us in the question. Then it can get deposited on the ciliary zonules, which leads to zonular weakness. When there is zonular weakness, the strength of holding the lens will be low and that will lead to what everybody? That will lead to phacodonesis. Now, do we remember what is phacodonesis? Phacodonesis is trembling lens. When we see the lens, we ask the patient to move the eye up, down, left, right. We see that the lens is always shaky or trembling. 
that is due to zonular weakness deposit of the fibrillary material on the zonules. Apart from this, we are able to see poor midriasis and trans illumination defects. Trans illumination defects at pupillary margin due to some coexisting iris atrophy along with the fibrillary deposit we see some trans illumination defects what do we mean by trans illumination defects normally iris should be an opaque tissue but if there is iris atrophy everybody it will become like a mesh and when it becomes like a mesh i will be able to see the red fundal reflex from the iris tissue or from within the iris tissue so trans illumination through the iris i am able to see the background illumination lastly everybody there is something called as the Sam Powell Lessi line. If you have ever heard the name, we know that this is also seen in pigmentary glaucoma or pigmentary disease. Yes, also seen in pigmentary glaucoma. What is Sam Powell Lessi line? Deposition of the fibrillary material at your yeah, own Schwalbe's line. All right. So these are the important clinical features so as to say wherever it can get deposited everybody in the anterior segment all these structures it is going to produce a clinical feature please remember the important points that is the phnox at the pupillary margin the target sign the image vector asked and the most common identifiable cause it is of secondary open angle glaucoma please remember that this is usually a bilateral condition albeit asymmetrical we will see it is more in one eye less in other eye and it is due to mutation of a gene called as Loxel1. Just some other peripheral information to round up our topic on pseudo exfoliation syndrome. Now, if I go back to the options quickly, everybody, there was one option which was voscious ring. Let us see what was voscious ring. Voscious ring, all of us, I hope, remember that it is a sign of blunt trauma. Right, guys? Now, what is voscious ring? If you don't remember, this is what voscious ring is. Yes. It is an imprint of meiotic pupil on the anterior surface of lens. So, as I like to say, the examiners ask from a certain pool of topics only. They are very rarely asking out of that pool in NEET, everybody. Uh, the image of uh, Voschius ring was given in NEET 2021 and identification was asked. This time, the option was Voschius ring, but the identifier was changed to target sign. So more or less everything that you know is going to get asked. It's all about revision. As I say, the more you revise, the more you are able to remember these simple topics. And that is an art again, guys. The more we do MCQs, the more we read, the more we are able to form lists. We give you lists, but apart from that, students themselves, when they work hard, they are able to form lists of the topics which they find frequently getting asked or the topics which are more important. And that is the key. You, we need to move towards our goal with clarity in mind of what we are doing in each revision, what is more important, what is less important. Moving on to the second question, everybody, that was asked in NEET PG. A patient presents with history of penetrating trauma or penetrating injury. So not a question on blunt trauma. We are not talking about all the things related to voscious ring, voscious ring, blunt trauma, as we just now saw. A diagnosis of sympathetic ophthalmitis was confirmed. All of us know or all of us, I think, should remember that sympathetic ophthalmitis occurs due to penetrating trauma, right? Which of the following will be seen? So it is a direct question on the fact that what is sympathetic ophthalmitis? So if we jog our brains even a little, I hope we remember that sympathetic ophthalmitis was studied under the topic uvia and in uvia it was studied under the topic pan uveitis. I have always spoken clearly that sympathetic ophthalmitis is a case of bilateral granulomatous pan uveitis. The answer should have been pretty straightforward. But still, I don't know why a lot of students got back to me and said, sir, we marked anterior uveitis acute. Somebody said chronic. I have no idea why. There is no confusion in this. It has been clearly taught under the causes of pan-uveitis. VKH syndrome and sympathetic ophthalmitis are the two important causes of pan-uveitis which are commonly asked. Still, if we don't remember what is sympathetic ophthalmitis, let us see. It is bilateral granulomatous pan-uveitis. Why does it occur? It occurs due to it occurs due to penetrating 
trauma. This trauma is usually accidental or more commonly I can say accidental. Though we say it can also be seen in cases after intraocular surgery or multiple intraocular surgery, but the more common is accidental penetrating trauma to ciliary body. It is postulated that the sequestered antigens in the uveal tissue, the ciliary body, they are released, which lead to the inflammation. And that is why ciliary body is the dangerous area for the causation of sympathetic ophthalmitis post cases of penetrating trauma. What else we know everybody? I hope we remember the story, the Hindi movie story, that the trauma will be to the hero, but the pain will be suffered by the heroine. Yes. So that what we mean to say, we mean to say, that sympathetic ophthalmitis develops in non-traumatic eye. Yes, sympathizing eye, non-traumatic eye. And usually we say around about 80% cases develop between 2 weeks to 3 months. So that is our timeline. That at least 2 weeks we say pass before sympathetic ophthalmitis develops in the non-traumatic, the sympathizing or the other eye. Now, let us discuss it a little bit further everybody. What about the histopathology of sympathetic ophthalmitis? So, the histopathology of sympathetic ophthalmitis tells us that there is lymphocytic infiltration of choroid. Okay. We are talking about uvia here, yes. Also, we see something called as Dallin-Fuchs nodules. Please remember, these are not pathognomic for sympathetic ophthalmitis. They are also seen in VKH syndrome. So, please just don't go by the name Dallin-Fuchs nodules, sympathetic ophthalmitis. That is not true. You will get the question wrong. What are Dallin-Fuchs nodules? That is what I can tell you. These are granulomas which are formed between the innermost layer of the choroid, which I hope we remember is known as Brooks membrane and the outermost layer of retina, which is called the retinal pigment epithelium. So, these are two consistent histopathologic features of sympathetic ophthalmitis. If I talk about the clinical features, in a sense, that was the question, what is sympathetic ophthalmitis? So, they are asking you, what are the clinical features or what is the problem in sympathetic ophthalmitis in the eye? Yes. So, sympathetic ophthalmitis, as we said, is bilateral. Okay. So, even though conceptually we say that the traumatic eye, sympathetic ophthalmitis does not develop, the name is sympathetic, sympathizing, it develops in the non-traumatic eye, but pan-uveitis is seen in both the eyes. In the traumatic eye, trauma is good enough to cause uveitis. In the other eye, it is sympathetic ophthalmitis causing pan-uveitis. Alright? We say everybody that there is anterior uveitis. in both eyes. When I say both eyes means traumatic eye, traumatic uveitis, right? As well as the sympathizing eye. But pan uveitis, that means anterior uveitis which had already developed everybody converts into pan uveitis with the involvement of the retina, vitritis, choroiditis, everything. It develops only in sympathizing eye. And that is why the answer to our question, I hope you understand clearly, is pan uveitis. Okay? Traumatic eye would develop uveitis, but it will only be anterior uveitis. Here it is being asked what is sympathetic ophthalmitis. Finally, everybody, if we remember. Two questions which are asked everybody, how to prevent sympathetic ophthalmitis? We have a two week window, yes or no? So if we know that the traumatic eye, penetrating trauma is become useless, useless means it has lost all potential for vision. Then we say one eye is gone, at least save the other by doing what everybody? I know all these are easy questions, yes, enucleation of traumatic eye within within two weeks, yes. But if sympathetic ophthalmitis has already developed, 
that means two weeks have passed sympathetic ophthalmitis has developed already you can see all the keratic precipitates flare the exudates in the vitreous the vitritis the chorioretinitis everything sympathetic ophthalmitis pan uveitis has already developed then obviously it is inflammation so we have to give high dose oral steroids they continue for they start with iv then we switch on to oral actually that is what we do and we have to continue it for long time sometimes we see up to around one to two years the patient has to keep on taking steroids to be able to avoid relapses otherwise the relapses are very very common in cases of sympathetic ophthalmitis i hope we're pretty clear about sympathetic ophthalmitis in toto it is a very simple condition probably the only manifestation important manifestation of penetrating trauma which forms a topic where questions are asked to us moving on to the third question neat pg 2022 recall everybody retina based question everybody a diabetic patient so i as soon as i hear diabetic i think about diabetic retinopathy okay a diabetic patient is given with a visual equity of 6 by 9 in one eye all right with what is the finding pre retinal hemorrhage and with neovascularization at optic disc i think everything gets solved as soon as we read this neovascularization at optic disc why as soon as i hear neovascularization i know the diabetic retinopathy is conveniently divided only into two stages npdr and pdr and neovascularization is a sign of pdr yes what is the management in this patient so basically it is trying to ask you what is the management of a patient with proliferative diabetic retinopathy as i've always said p4 proliferative p4 problem and that is why p4 what is the treatment pan retinal photocoagulation okay answer is clear but again when we read the question when we read the options the options may be confusing to us because we know coagulation but there is little focal laser coagulation so it is only neovascularization at the optic disc shouldn't the answer be focal i have explained again and again to everybody once neovascularization has started occurring it can be at nvd or it can be nve neovascularization elsewhere there is severe hypoxia in all the retina so we never do focal laser what do we do everybody we do pan retinal photocoagulation there are only two treatment options for pdr what are the two treatment options for pdr the treatment of choice is pan retinal photocoagulation and the other treatment option that we have is anti vegf drug all right if you are still confused let us see we have read that all cases of pdr also don't need to be treated which cases of pdr need to be treated let's see high risk pdr this is the pdr which needs treatment okay so if we have forgotten let us revise what is a high risk pdr neovascularization of the disc greater than this 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 that is about one third disc area it is not given to us in the question what is the disc area so point one is not valid for us but let us see point b any neovascularization of the disc with vitreous hemorrhage what has been given into the question pre-retinal hemorrhage along with neovascularization of the disc so this is what has been given to me are in the question so this is what has been given to us in our mcq here yes or no guys the third criteria if everybody nve nve greater than one by two disc area with vitreous hemorrhage so i remember it as nvd greater than equal to one by three disc area or nvd with vitreous hemorrhage or nve greater than equal to one by two disc area with vitreous hemorrhage yes or no that is how in short we remember what is high risk pdr so if we remember this we have determined in the mcq let us go back that this is a case of high risk pdr have we some students said sir vitreous hemorrhage is not written are you saying this if you are saying this then please see it is written pre-retinal hemorrhage but sir we don't know what is pre-retinal hemorrhage then i am a little confused then let us see vitreous hemorrhage if you don't know what is a pre-retinal hemorrhage then i hope we need a revision of vitreous hemorrhage okay so vitreous hemorrhage can be divided into two types number one pre-retinal hemorrhage 
और समटाइम्स इट इज ऑल्सो मैंशन एज सब हाइलॉइड हेमरेज ओके सो वेरियस ऑथर्स यूज वेरियस नेम्स प्री रेटिनल हेमरेज और सब हाइलॉइड हेमरेज वॉट इज प्री रेटिनल हेमरेज और सब हाइलॉइड इट इज a boat shaped hemorrhage that is the first key and it is bleeding between the detached posterior vitreous and ilm what is ilm everybody internal limiting membrane the innermost layer of retina what do we mean by detached posterior vitreous vitreous should ideally be attached it is a gel yes or no if, if this is my vitreous and this is my innermost layer of retina the posterior surface of vitreous is attached to the innermost layer of retina but in diabetic retinopathy due to the various changes the posterior vitreous gets detached pvd posterior vitreous detachment so there is a small space which is forming between the internal limiting membrane and the posterior surface of detached vitreous and in between that the hemorrhage or the blood is collecting and that is what is known as pre retinal just before the retina or sub hyaloid just behind the vitreous and this is board shaped as you can see in this photograph then this photograph in itself is a spotter everybody yes secondly we say intra gel hemorrhage when we say intra gel hemorrhage i think it is pretty clear that now the bleed is entering into the vitreous cavity itself yes or no so it is bled into the vitreous cavity the whole vitreous not just the interface everybody the pre retinal interface but the whole vitreous is now stained by blood so when we are saying pre retinal hemorrhage in the question we are essentially saying vitreous hemorrhage only i hope it clears everything if not everybody i would not have even paid so much attention to this i would have just simply read this word in the question everybody what was the word i will again say there should have been no confusion let us keep things simple neovascularization in a patient of diabetes means proliferative diabetic retinopathy the treatment of choice has to be pan retinal photo coagulation but if we knew in detail we would have been more sure of our answer that's all right now what is focal laser photo coagulation and grid laser photo coagulation if you've never heard these i hope you should have heard these these are basically the treatment for diabetic macular edema diabetic macular edema when the fluid is collecting only at the macula then we prefer either focal laser photocoagulation which is burns to leaking microaneurysms or we prefer grid laser photocoagulation which is burns to areas where there is retinal thickening i hope we remember the definition of csme either diffuse retinal thickening greater than 500 microns within 500 microns from the center of the macula right i hope you remember all that yes okay if we do what is scleral buckling everybody scleral buckling is the treatment for retinal detachment retinal detachment can be treated by gases gases everybody yes sf3 yes or it can be treated by silicon oil in the vitreous cavity or it can be treated by scleral buckling so scleral buckling has nothing to do with the question that was asked the answer i hope i have been pretty clear again and again should be is pan retinal photocoagulation let us see the photograph of what a case of pan retinal photocoagulation looks like you will be able to see that barring the central macular area all the area has been photocoagulated so all these that you see these are prp spots prp spots everybody prp photocoagulation is done using which laser it is done using argon laser it is never done in a single sitting it is done over 3 to 5 sittings multiple sittings and what is the most common complication of prp the most common complication of prp is the development of visual field defects all right everybody these are certain facts about pan retinal photocoagulation that we need to remember moving on everybody to the next question that is the fourth question that was asked this was probably the question which confused the students the most okay let us read the question a 35 year old woman the first history that is given to us is of a female suffering with rheumatoid arthritis so two key questions or two key pieces of information were given to us in the question it is a female patient suffering from rheumatoid arthritis 
what associated complication is shown in the image. Now you were asked to identify what was seen in the image. So everybody, I hope we can see the whole cornea here. This is the sclera. And on the sclera, within the box that I have drawn, we see some kind of abnormality. What do we see? We see a bluish area or I can say a dark area in sclera. Okay. Now, if we know rheumatoid arthritis, we know that rheumatoid arthritis is usually associated with scleritis. Has been taught, everybody knows this, episcleritis is usually idiopathic, but scleritis is usually associated with granulomatous diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. If I knew this much, I would have straight away gone and said sclera, something to do with sclera. And my best guess would have been scleromalacia perforans. See, I don't know the question. I don't know the question. I don't know the image. But still, can I take an educated guess? Rather than doing a kad bakkad bambe bo, can I take an educated guess? And this is what my educated guess would have been. Let us see the other options. The other trick in these questions is to rule out. Coloboma. Have we read about coloboma? Yes. Coloboma is some deficiency in formation. Yes. Some missing piece, I can say usually seen in iris or seen in choroid or seen in eyelid all these structures nothing to do with sclera at all that could coloboma have been the answer no malignant melanoma melanoma brown deposit melanoma on the sclera melanoma on the iris yes iris melanoma uvl pigmented tissue yes or no uvl melanoma ruled out the only two options that could have confused students were scleromalacia perforans and ciliary staphyloma. As soon as I was able to come on to these two, I again think of rheumatoid arthritis. What does rheumatoid arthritis have to do with either scleromalacia perforans or ciliary staphyloma? Then I would have remembered that scleritis has been taught to me. Let us see what has been taught to me in scleritis. Scleritis is inflammation of sclera proper or the deeper vascular plexus of the sclera. It can present either as anterior non-necrotizing or it can present as anterior necrotizing. Fairly clear. Yes or no? Necrotizing with inflammation in diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. In diseases like Wagner's polyarthritis nodosa or surgically induced. But if I put my focus on this, anterior necrotizing scleritis without inflammation is known as scleromalacia perforans. Then if I read it further, I find it is written, it occurs in women with rheumatoid arthritis. There is no pain, nothing given in the history of the question. Vision is not affected, again nothing given in the question. There is no vascular congestion. No vascular congestion means usually there is no redness, it is a white eye. Now I go back to the question and I see it is a white eye, yes. There is no pain in given, given in the question. There is nothing to do with vision given in the question. Does it look like women, rheumatoid arthritis, without inflammation, scleromalacia, perforance? Yes. So I think there were lots of clues which should have been able to answer scleromalacia perforance. But then, obviously, it was a confusing question. I know that. Ciliary staphyloma. Staphyloma is what everybody? What is staphyloma? Staphyloma is ectatic bulge. Yes or no? Ect Ectatic bulge, ciliary, just behind limbus with incarceration of ciliary body tissue. This is what staphyloma, and specifically if we are talking about ciliary staphyloma is. So a lot of students told me, sir, the photograph had shown a bulge. But the majority said, sir, there was no bulge. We don't know. I, as the examiner, don't know what the actual photograph was. So going with the fact that there was no bulge, going with the fact that it was clearly written woman, it was clearly written rheumatoid arthritis, I would still think that the answer is scleromalacia perforans. Only if the image showed a very frank bulge, everybody, then only it could have been staphyloma. 
बट देन एज आई विल टीच यू जस्ट नाउ स्टेफाइलोमा कैन अकर ड्यू टू स्क्रो मलेशिया परफोरेंस इट सेल्फ लेट अस सी एवरीबडी इन डिटेल जस्ट अ लिटिल बिट अबाउट स्क्लेरो मलेशिया परफोरेंस स्क्लेरो मलेशिया परफोरेंस इज अ टाइप थ्री हाइपर सेंसिटिविटी रिएक्शन वॉट अकर्स इन दिस एवरीबडी इट इज नेक्रोटाइपिंग सो वी से नेक्रोटिक स्क्लेरल प्लाक्स आर फॉर्म्ड near limbus which then coalesces when they coalesces they lead to larger areas of necrosis so basically they are leading to scleral thinning and when scleral thinning occurs uveal tissue which is bluish is visible beneath it and that is what is known as scleromalacia perforans i hope you understand yes scleromalacia sclera getting malaise thinned out and that is why it is going to be perforated it is not perforated but it looks as if it is going to be perforated in such a case everybody if iop is increased it is a thinned out area if iop is increased then it will lead to bulge then it will lead to Staphyloma. So, due to neither a clear bulging visible in the photograph nor anything given about increased IOP in the patient, based on the information we know, the beautiful, the best answer here is scleromalacia perforans. I hope we are clear, guys. I hope we have been able to revise scleritis. I hope we know the differences between scleritis and episcleritis. Episcleritis reddish, scleritis bluish. Episcleritis, the vessels branch on phenylephrine 2.5 percent. In scleritis, there is no blanching. Yes, so certain basic differences between cases of episcleritis versus scleritis. Moving on to the next question, question number five. Everybody, what is the indication of this procedure? So again, it was a image-based question. It was a spotter. Everybody, we needed to see the image. Now, as soon as I see the image, what do I see? I see some kind of a ring. I'll just mark the arrows. Let me change the color, guys. I'll just mark the arrows. We can see here, and we can see here. So I will say this is a peripheral ring in the cornea. Yes or no? Transparent ring. Behind this ring, still the iris tissue is visible. So that means it is not in the iris. It is in the cornea. So this is a peripheral ring in the cornea. or i can actually say if i see carefully these are two peripheral rings in the cornea two semicircular peripheral rings in the cornea now as soon as i see this photograph even though i may not have seen this photograph before but i would have read about something called as intax procedure intracorneal stromal rings now if i know what are intracorneal stromal rings i know it is the treatment of keratoconus Conus. So again, I know it is a difficult question. Again, uh, I know you are now saying, "Oh, what kind of images can be asked?" Yes, images are asked. That is the trend now. We should be able to see as many images as we can. But as I like to say, images without the knowledge of the base of what we are seeing the image about are useless. You can remember information, but to remember thousands of images without knowing the information firsthand is almost impossible. Yep. so let us discuss intax in a little detail everybody so we are basically talking about so we are basically talking about intra corneal ring segments so called as i c r s intra corneal ring segments the two popular intra corneal ring segments manufactured by different companies one of them is intax the name we usually use the name we usually use in india and the second is ferrera rings both are almost the same thing okay they are just brand names and the basic name is intracorneal ring segments all right now what are these let us talk about intax specifically these are two polymethyl meth acrylate segments each with an arc length of 150 degrees 
all right so they are not complete semicircles they are not covering 180 degree they are covering 150 so when we are actually implanting them in the cornea we see 150 we see 150 everybody so 30 degree 30 degree that is left all right so we are implanting not a complete circular ring okay now what do they do everybody they flatten the cornea how are they flattening the cornea when we are pushing the rings in the periphery in the stroma they are breaking the collagen fibers they are breaking the lamella and thus they are stretching the cornea when they are stretching the cornea they are decreasing the curvature they are flattening what is the problem in keratoconus the problem in keratoconus is that the cornea which is convex has become cone shaped the curvature has increased there is protrusion yes or no we need to flatten it out everybody to solve the problems of uh, protrusion which is happening leading to thinning which may lead to perforation later on which is leading to all the astigmatic visual problems everybody so flattening of the cornea is directly proportional to the thickness of the intracorneal ring segments am i make myself very clear if we need more flattening then the ring has to be thicker the more thicker the more lamella it will break the more flattening is going to happen okay now what are the indications for intracorneal ring segments the indications are keratoconus number one that is the answer in the question second pellucid marginal degeneration and thirdly post laser surgery basically we are trying to say post lasik if there is any corneal ectasia a lot of times if uh, the surgeon is not careful before doing lasik we know that for LASIK, the minimum corneal thickness has to be 450 microns, everybody. Yes or no? So, if topography is not done correctly, if the surgeon is not careful and post-surgery, we see that the cornea is becoming thin. Uh, so, due to the thinning, everybody, ectasia will develop everybody. Yes or no? Degenerative thinning. And due to that, it will turn into a case of protrusion. So, again, in those cases, intracorneal ring segments or intacts, everybody, they are helpful. We have also read that intacts can be used for the treatment of myopia but these days with better treatment options we are saying that this is not an absolute indication the use has become very less for myopia why everybody because of two or three reasons what is the two or three reasons number one induced astigmatism this induces a high level of astigmatism when we want to treat for myopia we don't want to make the patient end up with astigmatism a lot of patients of myopia are getting operated to get the spectacles removed. They don't want to convert their spherical into cylindrical. Also, they have a very limited range of correction. That means we cannot use them if we want to correct a minus 8 diopter spherical myopia. So, the range is very limited, minus 2 to minus 4, minus 5 at max. And that is why it has fallen out of favor. So, if we are saying, basically, we are saying in cases of corneal ectasias, like the natural ectasia keratoconus or if it is LASIK surgery induced or post laser surgery induced. Right guys, I hope we are clear about intacts as a treatment option for keratoconus. Moving on to the last question that was asked in NEET PG 2022. Everybody, again a question out of retina or we can say a question which harbingered on ophthalmology plus biochemistry everybody. Yes, a young boy presents with mental retardation. That is the key that is being given to you. His fundus examination, that is the ophthalmology, that is the biochemistry, is given below. So, let us see the ophthalmology part here, everybody. What can we see in the photograph? Let us see. This is the optic disc. All right. These are the blood vessels. Wherever the blood vessels form an arc, that becomes which side? Temporal side. We know that macula is situated on the temporal side and it, the center of macula is avascular. So, this is my macula. Now, what abnormality do I see on the macula? I see a cherry red spot at macula. Yes, I know it's a direct spotter, but I have gone into the details of how to diagnose this if you have never seen such a photograph or if you don't know how to see fundus photographs. So, the diagnosis is pretty simple, cherry red spotted macula. Now, as soon as I notice cherry red spotted macula, I hope we know the causes. Cherry trees never grow tall in sand, mud and grime. If I know that mnemonic, if I know the causes of cherry red spot, I know 
Hunter and Hurler are nowhere in the picture here, everybody. Yes, MPSCs are nowhere in the picture. Yes, only two options I know, Tay-Sex and Gauchas, which can cause. Let us see if you don't remember the mnemonic. Causes of cherry red spot. Cherry trees never grow tall in sand, mud and grime. C for central retinal artery occlusion. T for trauma, blunt trauma. Everything below this, everybody, is biochemistry for us. Yes, N for Neiman pick. GM when gangliosidosis is, then Tay-Sex and Sandoff, which are GM2 gangliosidosis is, M for metachromatic leukodystrophy, multiple sulfatase deficiency, and G for Gauchers. So, we are stuck with two options here, Tay-Sex disease and Gauchers disease. Based on this mnemonic, this is how much ophthalmology tells you. If we have read even a little bit of biochemistry, everybody, then we know mental retardation should be a feature of Gauchers or Tay-Sex. Yes, obviously, it should be a feature of Tay-Sex, and that is why the answer in this question was Tay-Sex disease. Let us revise Tay-Sachs and Gauchas if we don't know everybody. Let us start with Tay-Sachs disease. Tay-Sachs disease is an autosomal recessive inheritance. In this, there is enzyme deficiency of which enzyme everybody? beta hexaminidase A. This enzyme is absent due to the mutation in the corresponding gene everybody due to which what is occurring everybody gm2 ganglio side is accumulating in neurons in neurons if you if i remember this i can correlate mental retardation the gm2 ganglio side which is usually metabolized by the enzyme beta hexosaminidase A, it is not getting metabolized, that is why it is accumulating in the neurons and that is what is leading to all the clinical features. So, what are the important clinical features of Tay-Sachs disease, everybody? What is the most common form, first of all? Most common form is infantile. Uh, there is infantile onset, there is juvenile onset, there is adult onset, so, but the most common is infantile onset. Usually, the onset is 3 to 6 months of age, everybody, and the life expectancy is not very high. What are the important clinical features, everybody? Exaggerated startle response. Yes, you must have read it in a lot of subjects, everybody. Maybe pediatrics, maybe biochemistry. Yes. Also, there is loss of fine motor skills and gross motor skills, everything. There is muscular weakness overall. Along with that, we see mental retardation. Along with that, we see seizures. And obviously, cherry red spot at macula. These are the important clinical features of a case of Tay-Sachs disease. Just a quick revision for you. Let us similarly revise Gaucher's disease. Gaucher's disease is due to mutation of which gene? It is due to mutation of GBA gene. Yes or no? What are the clinical features of Gaucher's disease? We are talking about type 1. Type 1 is the most common. Type 2 and type 3 are very rare, yes? So, the clinical features are number 1, hepatosplenomegaly. Number 2, everybody, now think about spleen, think about blood, everybody. Thrombocytopenia, anemia. See, that's the art of how to link one word with another to be able to remember more information, yes? Then, we see lung disease. And we see bony abnormalities also. Not going into the detail, guys, of the bony abnormalities and the lung disease. Being very superficial here, that is Gaucher's disease. I hope you are able to remember this much. And if you remember this much, then I hope using your common sense and using your knowledge of two subjects, you would have been able to answer Tay-Sex disease. Right? As you would have seen, this is our end of the six questions that were asked in NEAT PG. And I hope you were able to find neat PG questions easy. A lot of them were direct from our notes and our videos that were shown. A lot of them were using two subjects, but still they were direct questions. So very rarely do we find ophthalmology getting asked difficultly in neat PG. I again say at the end of this video, it is important to revise. Just focus on the simple facts that have been told to you, the simple concepts that have been told to you. Yes, when we are doing the exam, we need to have the attitude for the exam also. Aptitude is one thing, that is knowledge that you have acquired. But attitude is the other thing which you yourself are able to develop by giving as many test series, GTs, 
all the subject based tests as much as possible that way your mind gets attuned to how to solve a question directly we can solve a question we can rule out options we can take an educated guess there are various ways of answering the same question depending on how much knowledge and how much use of the knowledge you are able to do at that particular moment thank you guys bye bye